When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jesus preached the word to the multitudes from the boat. Afterward, after he preached, finished preaching, he then confirmed his word with a divine miracle. He told Peter to row into the deep water and let out the nets. They caught a great haul of fish, although there had not been even a nibble through the whole night. And the net tore, but still held a great mass of fish. The boats began to sink, and yet did not sink. And both fish and men came safely on land. And now, Peter and the rest are called to do the same in the world with the word as the dragnet, to gather in the little fishes, that's you, through water, baptism, into his boat, the church. And so we heard of Peter's calling. We also heard of Elisha's being called. Is Jesus saying then that we should all forsake the needs of our family and livelihood and commit to church vocations? Does he call everyone to be a pastor or a teacher, musician or some other churchly vocation? Some are called to ministry that depends on the congregation's love for income and other needs, to be sure. But not all are called, like Peter, to walk away from their work and to pursue a new career at Jesus' command. Not all are called to churchly vocations, but all are called to live as Christians in their vocations. Obedience to the third commandment and obedience to the seventh commandment may occur together. Indeed, they should occur together. The third and seventh commandment do not contradict one another. For adherence to the seventh cannot be fully God-pleasing unless it is accompanied by obedience to the third commandment. Of course, you're asking, what are the third and seventh commandments? Maybe you remember. In the third commandment, the Lord commands us to, to keep the Sabbath day holy. That is, we are to diligently hear his word, not merely holding a weekly external Sabbath worship, which we surely do, but to daily keep a lasting spiritual Sabbath within one's heart. That is, long for the heavenly treasures of God's word and to abstain from what it's, the word forbids. That's the third commandment. And then in the seventh commandment, God, the Lord God commands us not to steal. That is, we are to be content with what we have and to work to provide for ourselves by our own hands. You see, these two commandments, the Sabbath day and working, do not strive against one another, they're both God-given, as we'll hear next, in next week's Old Testament text. Both are God-given. Therefore, obedience to one commandment goes with adherence to the other. Christians often gather together, even on work days, to hear God's word and to nourish themselves by it. Those of you who have farms know that, well, there's never a day off. But yet, you took time this morning to be here, to be nourished by God's word, maybe even to give a miraculous catch like he did for Peter. Work in your earthly vocation does not hinder or harm attention to God's word, so long as you keep them straight. This is why Jesus constrained Peter to come on board to his boat and to tend to the fisherman's trade after he had preached from the boat. God has ordained that man should eat his bread in the sweat of his brow. Genesis 3, so that by working, our flesh may be tamed and we are subject again to obedience to the Spirit, recognizing all things comes from the Lord. That which the Lord God himself orders cannot be opposed to God. That which the Lord God himself ordains for us cannot get in the way of piety or fear of him. Our work cannot get in the way of worship. We must serve the Lord God in our vocation by true faith within our hearts, with godly reverence and love, 
by showing love to our neighbor and by patient and humble expectation that God will bless that work. But also interrupting our work at a special time to hear God's word is not the only way to serve him, although he certainly gives us that. But even in the middle of our work, we can lift up our hearts to God and sing a hymn of praise. See what your coworkers think of that. <laughs> or begin or end your day, your work day, with thanksgiving or in prayer. Or maybe you can multitask and you can listen to the recording of the congregation of prayer while you work. Or use one of the many devotional resources, some of which you see in our bulletin. There's many ways to sanctify your day by the word so that you can even go about your work in the word. For by the divine word and prayer, all our deeds are sanctified, says Paul to Timothy. This view, when viewed properly, obedience to the third and the seventh commandments are in no way contradictory, even though we often set them at odds. For obedience to the seventh commandment, you shall not steal, in other words, you should work, is not wholly pleasing to God unless it is accompanied by attention to his word, the third commandment. As a matter of fact, if we are to feed ourselves by the work of our hands and to do so with joy and contentment, we have to begin and end with God's blessing. If God is to bless our work, then we, we must celebrate the Sabbath both inwardly and outwardly, weekly and even daily. Because breaking the Sabbath is actually punished by a curse. Peter first loaned Christ his boat, as we heard today, and then he caught the great haul of fish, even though previously he had caught none. What's the difference but God's word? Therefore, take care first for your soul. Take Christ into the little boat of your heart and let him teach and work in it. And then all your other work, the work of your hands, will be blessed, regardless of what vocation he has called you to. The third commandment comes first, and then the seventh follows. They're put in order for a reason. Obedience to the third commandment should be first to us, and then we will follow with the seventh commandment. First attend to God's word, and then attend to your work. Well, this is of course true, because none of the work that you can do, even the most noble of vocations, can achieve faith, that is trust in God. This is why we first begin with prayer. We pray, for example, for daily bread. If we could accomplish this through our work, we wouldn't pray for it. <laughs> so why should we humbly pray for it, except so that God give it. If we are to receive our daily bread from God's hand, we must also then follow God's admonition. As he says in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added to you. God's kindness is the wellspring of every blessing, even the blessing of work, even earthly goods. Whatever is not drawn from the spring of God's word cannot be blessed. As the psalmist says, a little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of the wicked. Why is this? And it has to do with the heart. We can only accomplish our work, our daily work, if our hearts are set right by God through his word. With prayer and thanksgiving, the righteous man has received the little he has from God. He knows it. He believes it. And thus, that little he has is blessed and sanctified. Conversely, the godless, they build up a store of temporal goods by their own hands, by their own doing, often through illicit means, against God's will. And of course then, lacking God's word, their goods cannot be blessed and sanctified and become a curse to them, like the dragon's hoard. The righteous man possesses the little he has with a good conscience. But the godless man suffers a constant nagging conscience. Tell me, who is actually the richer of the two? The righteous man who has little but has God, his greatest treasure. He is the one who is rich in God. And his work will be blessed. Or is it the godless man who does not have God's grace? And despite all of his hard work and his great wealth, is he not poor even though he possesses a kingdom? For what has the man who does not have God and owns all things but a guilty conscience and his sin 
and thus eternal death and damnation. Essential to our daily life is a strong faith. And with that faith comes a longing for heavenly riches, for God's word. And then also with that word, we learn a profound disregard for earthly things so that our heart clings alone to God as our greatest possession and treasure. As the psalmist says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So Jesus has called you today and rightly ordered your life for faith that your work may be a blessing. He called you today to receive with your hearts his saving word and the means to which he has attached that word of forgiveness. He's preached his word into your hearts to restore you to faith, to bring you through the water of your baptism again in absolution, and once again restored you to the holy ark of the Christian church, to be nurtured, restored, confident, and with a clean conscience. It's true, for your daily task, he may call you into more specific church vocations, thanks be to God, or he may call you to labor at home or on the farm or in the factory. Regardless, with whatever task the Lord sets before you, remain in Jesus and his word, and everything else will follow and be blessed according to his gracious will. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.